All right, so feel free to grab those snacks as, and then find yourself a seat. Also feel welcome to get up and grab more as you need it. Um, but I'm gonna get us started in uh, digging into our chat. So welcome to Science North. And this is the second of our series of Community Health Connections Science Cafes. Through these events, what our hope is, is to provide you with a place to connect with a variety of different experts and peers to learn about, discuss, and ask questions about COVID-19, vaccinations, and other health topics. Some of the questions and prompts for today's session will be the same or similar to some topics we discussed last session, um, and some will be different as well. We want to offer uh, a safe space with this event and welcoming space for everyone. And we'll be providing opportunities for you as the audience to give your input as well as hearing from our experts because they are both very valuable sources of information. And we're also uh, recording the audio from today's session to be able to share it as a podcast, to share it to uh, an even wider audience. If you do have any questions or concerns about that, um, please feel free to find me after the event and we'll definitely um, be able to chat about that, no problem. We also, when you are giving feedback throughout the event, have a um, square cube that is blue, and it's our microphone, and it's a super fun. We can throw it and catch it, and it's a microphone for you to be able to use when you are asking questions. Um, just helps us to be able to hear you better instead of you having to yell across the room at us. Now, before we dig right into the discussion with our experts, I do want to take a moment to reflect on the land where we're gathered. So Science North and Dynamic Earth are situated on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Atikmishing, Anishinaabek, and Wanapate First Nations in Robinson-Huron Treaty Territory. We give thanks to the Indigenous peoples who've cared for this land since time immemorial and pay respect to their traditions, ways of knowing, and acknowledge their many contributions to innovations in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, past and present. We also recognize the Métis Nation of Ontario for their historic and ongoing contributions. We commit to deepening engagement, relationships, and partnerships in order to advance truth and reconciliation, honor and reflect Indigenous ways of knowing, grow economic opportunities, and collaborate with Indigenous peoples as partners in order to inspire all people to be engaged with science in the world around them. Now, to get our discussion started today, let's get to know our panelists for the night. Uh, my name is Grace, and I'm the staff scientist of youth and diverse audiences here at Science North. I'll be our moderator, so asking questions and helping direct your questions to our panelists. And then beside me here, we have Claudette Giroux. Giroux rather. She's a public health nurse with Public Health Sudbury and Districts. We also have Deepa Jiva, a physiotherapist and researcher at Health Sciences North. And on the end, we have Wenda Alia, a mental health outreach worker with the YMCA Immigration Services. So to start off, could each of you take a turn to tell us just a little bit more about yourself and your work in healthcare or with newcomers? My name is Claudette. I'm a public health nurse with the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children's program at Public Health Sudbury Districts. I've been working at the health unit for a little over 15 years now, and I really enjoy my work. I love coming to meet new individuals and presenting information that is helpful to you. Um, I work in the Healthy Babies program where we support families who have children from zero to six. In my work with the families, I also um, answer our health information line where we get parents, where we invite parents to call in if they have any questions. So I'll talk a little bit more later on about uh, that health information line, but I'm happy to be here this evening and uh, hopefully sharing some good information with you. And my name is Deepa. I work as a physiotherapist at the Health Sciences North Hospital. And I work in intensive care unit. It's an ICU. So um, my job there is to keep my patients up and moving so that we can help them get out of the ICU and move to the floor. Uh, and I'm here to share my personal stories. Once I was sitting there when I came here, and I used the resources through YMCA. So now I think that it's my opportunity to provide what I can and share my personal stories to help you all cope up the way I coped up here. 
My name is Wenda. I'm the mental health outreach worker at YMCA Immigrant Services. Uh, the services that I provide are ongoing and as needed basis. Um, so I help newcomers, immigrants, uh, refugees uh, be connected with the services and um, uh, resources that are available in the community in terms of the, uh, mental health. Uh, I also do uh, develop uh, workshops and uh, present the workshops uh, related to mental health and well-being uh, for newcomers. Thank you. Awesome. So last session we began uh, our discussion by top exploring the topic of healthcare documents, so things like health cards, health insurance, and vaccination records. This session, I'd like to start off by exploring some other important areas of healthcare beyond that kind of acute or sudden healthcare need. Um, you know, things like sickness and injuries are kind of that sudden need, but there's a lot to healthcare beyond that as well. So, um, if we start with something that's a big change for a lot of newcomers to Canada or to Northern Ontario, that would be our climate and kind of the way we interact with our climate. We have a big seasonal change and many Canadians love our outdoor activities. So what kinds of health factors should newcomers be aware of as they adjust to the new climate and try out these new outdoor activities? So maybe I'll just start and share um, a little bit of information on our climate. So we do have really cold winters <laughs> and we do have warm enough uh, summers. So let's talk about winters to start off with. It's very important to ensure that on our cold winter days that we stay bundled up and protected. It's a good idea to always listen to the weather, make sure that we know the wind chill factor uh, before stepping up, stepping out, I mean. Um, and always ensuring that we don't stay outdoors too long um, to get frostbite because that is very painful and anything else you want to add? I just want to add one thing about um, wearing proper footwear because at the hospital we see lots of falls and falls as we as we grow older falls are not good because any falls can cause uh, significant injuries including fractures, head injuries, spinal cord injuries, anything. So make sure that you wear proper footwear when you go outside, especially with the current climate. It goes up and down like one day it's in plus and the next day morning it's minus and when you step out, you might step out on a black ice and might fall. So make sure that you wear proper footwear to avoid injuries. That's a good point. Um, does anyone have any questions about our winters? One thing, one more thing I want to add is um, wearing in layers. Because in the morning it might be cold, in the afternoon it might be warm, and then in the, in the evening it might be colder again. So make sure that you have layers so that you can take off and put back on as the temperature varies. Uh, because I wasn't prepared for this. So I was either very cold or very warm. So just a uh, feedback. <laughs> And the same for children, right? Children going to school, uh, we want to make sure that when they're taking the bus in the morning that they're well-dressed um, and, and that they can take off a layer, right? At school, they can, they can take something like their snow pants off and then still, um, you know, adjust to the weather in the afternoon. The other thing is come f spring, we do have a lot of rain, and so always making sure that the children have a raincoat with possibly um, an umbrella to school because you never know those storms can come in the afternoon where we get lots of rain. I'll just add as well, one of our audience members at the front here was holding up um, the little grips that go on the bottom of your shoes as well. So if you're, even if your shoes themselves don't have really great grip, you can get at lots of different stores little uh, add-ons that go on the bottom of your shoes and just give you that little extra bit of grip that sticks um, into the ice or um, into the slippery snow. Yeah, and just put them right in your bag and uh, you're good to go. You're not clopping around with them on the, on the floors indoors either. So definitely a great thing to share. That's a good point. It's, sorry, it's a good point because um, we do have like you mentioned, days that are really warm, and so ice forms, and then it snows, and then the ice, the snow uh, covers the ice, so it, children can slip, um, adults can slip, and it's very important to keep, um, 
to keep an eye out for the, the ice underneath the snow. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, as someone who came from a very warm country all year round, <laughs> um, when I f first experienced the Canadian winter, all I wanted to do was stay inside and hibernate, but that was not good for my physical and mental health. So I think it's important to keep active, find activities that uh, keep you uh, moving and keep active. So um, you can connect with community organizations like YMCA <laughs> and find those fun activities that um, makes, like, keep you going out. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, we do have great hiking trails in the winter where we can um, rent skis or snowshoes, um, depending on where you live in the city. But those are all um, things that you can call the city to find out what areas you can participate in activities. I think we've got either a comment or a question here, so we'll get the mic box sent over as well. Right over here. Yeah, there we go. At the local library, they also loan snowshoes. So you can take your library card and you can go to the library and loan out some snowshoes. That's a really good one, yeah. Yeah, the library is a great resource. Everything is free there. You can make a card. Uh, that's something I advocate to my clients is go get a library card. It's free. It's, you know, you can do so many things there. So we did uh, cold. Uh, we veered a little bit into spring with the rain. What about summer with the heat, um, the swimming that we like to do, our beaches and that kind of environment? So one thing that we have to um, consider with our summer months is uh, it can get very hot and the sun can get um, can get to us. So with children, especially, we want to monitor their, their outdoor activity because they're susceptible. Children are susceptible to heat injury. And so are older adults. So over 60, we usually say that we want to limit their time outdoors as well. So when they're going outside, children and older adults, we want to make sure that they have a larger hat that they can cover themselves. We want them to make sure that they're wearing sunscreen, so at least... Um, it's at least 20 minutes before they go outdoors, they should be wearing sunscreen and reapply every two hours. Um, we also wanna make sure that they have proper footwear when they go outside because sometimes when they walk on the pavement, the pavement is very hot as well. And so we wanna make sure we prevent any injury. We have lots of beaches around Sudbury and um, for most of the summer we do have uh, lifeguards so there'll be lifeguards to, um, to monitor. Plus also have a look at the Environmental Canada updates. They also provide updates about uh, blue and green algae in the water. So if you see that, make sure that you don't go in the water. Even the puppies, I don't think the puppies are allowed either in the water if you see uh, update about green or blue algae updates. And um, I wanna share a personal story. I'm from India. And I moved here 11 years ago. Till I was in India, I never applied sunscreen lotion. Never even once I applied sunscreen lotion. So when I came here, I went to a beach, and I was the only one with my family. I was the only one who didn't apply it. And I'm seeing everybody else applying sunscreen lotion. I'm like, why? Then when my daughter came out of the water, and I could see her cheeks are so red, um, her arms was good, but the cheeks were so red because the body was inside the water, but her, she, she had her, um, she had her uh, head out. So f it, it was fully red. Then I started to apply sunscreen lotion for her. Not for me, because I don't go into the water. I, used to, uh, I, sit in, I sit on the beach. Then I learned about skin cancers in Canada. Then I started to apply uh, sunscreen lotion. Coming from India, like I didn't know that we should apply sunscreen lotion at all. So it's a good lesson for me, and I make and I want to tell that uh, the UV index in Canada is quite high. So make sure that you apply sunscreen lotion to protect yourself. And we want to make sure with children that we apply their ears, right? We want to catch every surface. Um, and the other thing as well that I was going to say was um, individuals, women who are pregnant are also susceptible to heat injury. So we want to monitor their 
time outdoors as well. Awesome, yeah, I'll echo the sunscreen in your ears. I missed that one Canada day when I was outside all day and it didn't go well. <laughs> The other thing as well is, is wearing protective, like sunglasses, right? A lot of us forget to protect our eyes, but our eyes can also get um, sun damage, so we want to make sure that we wear the proper um, sunglasses out when we're out. Great. Um, I want to give a chance to, if anybody in the audience has a question about sort of that realm of, of climate or things we do outside or, or um, that kind of area, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to uh, put up your hand and we'll get the mic brought over for that. I think one of the biggest topics uh, that you missed was hydration. Because I see that a lot with, with what I do, and the sports that I do, and it's a huge thing. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, especially children and older, older adults, we want to make sure that they remain hydrated during their time outdoors. So having available um, water um, jugs or... or um, a drink that they can have during their time outdoors, especially if you're doing physical activity. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, in winter, you know when you have turned on the, the heater, it causes, for some people, the nose bleeding. So we were told we would needed to use a humidifier, but um, how can we prevent or help even more this situation, for kids especially? That's a very good question. Um, if, if anyone has any concern about the child in nosebleeds, they can certainly call our health information line. And I do have some uh, rack cards that anyone can take if they have um, a concern and they can call in. We're available Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 to answer any questions. Um, and mainly with the nose, what happens when, when we um, when we breathe in air that's dry a lot of the time, what happens is we can get little cracks, just like our fingers, right? When we're outside and the cold weather, sometimes our fingers will crack. And so sometimes it's possible to have a little crack in the skin inside the nose, which causes a nosebleed. A lot of times it bleeds a lot because we have lots of blood vessels in the nose inside the nose. So a lot of times children especially can bleed often from those little cracks because of the, the um, numerous blood vessels. And so what we want to try to do is, is hydrate or, or moisturize that area. So again, if you have any concerns about that, it's calling us and we'll provide you with um, like we'll do an assessment over the phone, find out exactly what's happening, making sure that we can give you the proper information for that. But it's, it's number one, making sure the, the area that you're in is, is um, the, the increased humidity and um, moisturizing that skin wherever it's cracked that keeps bleeding. Okay. So I have two things on that topic. My daughter had that happen, so we rectified it with a fan. So she had a fan, and that helped her with that. So the fan. The other thing is about hydration topic. There's a water filling station in the countryside arena, which I use quite often, even in the wintertime, to fill up my jugs and everything. So if that's helpful for anybody, I use that a lot in the summertime for filling my water. So um, near Countryside Arena in the South End, there's a water filling station where you can bring your water jugs and, and um, use that to fill your jugs. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So um, we touched on this actually a little bit, the, the, the question about home and nosebleeds actually is a really kind of a good um, segue to the next piece that I had. Um, if we focus in more from, so we were looking at our environment, now we focus into our homes, um, what kinds of things should we be watching for in our homes to make sure that they're supporting our health and, and what kind of resources are out there as well for us to make sure our homes are supporting our health? 
So we want to make sure that you have um, an environment that is safe, number one. So free of, like especially for children, we want to make sure that the area is safe. Um, we do have a booklet here that we use when we work with our families in the, pro in the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children's program. It's growing up in a new land. And um, I can provide anyone with a copy if they need one. I only have a few with me today, but I can certainly provide you with an electronic link this evening or have more copies. But they do have um, things to consider when you have young children in a home. Um, when it comes to if, if it's a rental, so if you're renting, uh, we want to make sure that you are aware that the concerns, if there are concerns with the building that you're, with the environment you're in, if you're renting, that you um, discuss any issues that are happening with your, with the individual you're renting from. And then if you have any concerns, if your needs aren't being met, you can always call the health, in, the health unit because we do have um, environmental health inspectors who can support any individual who's having who's experiencing any challenges so we can uh, provide you with uh, information over the phone or if a visit needs to be done in um, in your living quarters then we can uh, provide that through a health inspector so you would call the health unit they would transfer you to a health inspector and you can get some support either over the phone or in person. I see a hand up over there, so we'll get the mic over there for the question. Um, that service that you were mentioning about the health inspector, it's a free service? Yes. All services at the health unit are free except for some immunizations, but um, uh, all services are free at the health unit, yes. Good question. Perfect, yeah. So since you touched on um, immunizations, maybe we'll zoom over there for a minute um, and talk about what kind of immunizations or what kind of resources do we need to know about in terms of uh, immunization? So if we're talking about COVID immunization, so COVID-19 vaccines are available at the health unit um, at any time. So if you've had your vaccines elsewhere, um, and you would like to know what you're due for, you definitely just can call our health unit. They'll transfer you to a nurse who's an expert in, um, in answering those questions, and she will let you know when you're due for your next one or, or what, you are actually, what vaccine you're actually due for. So that's for COVID-19, and we run clinics weekly. Like, um, there are several opportunities every week to get the vaccines. Now, if it's for yourself or if it's for a member of your family, if you're unsure what you are due or when you're due for your next vaccines, we do have vaccination clinics um, at the health unit for routine vaccines. And uh, you can call the health unit to book appointments. You would have to come into the health unit. We have um, services at our Paris Street location by the hospital. We do have some on the island and also in Espanola where we do a variety of, of clinics um, depending on where you are in the, in the city. Um, but again, it's, it's to call the health unit and to book an appointment. I just wanna add one more thing. In addition to regular vaccine provided um, as a part of a protocol, in Canada, the flu vaccine is also very, very important because flu affects children and adults, older adults especially, significantly. So it is very important that the uh, families with the younger children protect themselves against flu by accessing uh, vaccination for flu. And I do have some, sorry, I do have some um, fact sheets and um, pamphlets that display the um, vaccination records for children uh, or the vaccination schedule. I apologize, not record. Um, and also if you have your, if your, 
you're a permanent resident resident in Sudbury now, and you have vaccines that were um, given in the past, and you want to update a record, we can also help you with that. How to input your your information um, from the country where you're from, and now bringing it here to our system and finding out if there's anything that you need, we can help you with that as well. Uh, what I was going to um, just jump in and ask, or um, touch on was flu vaccine being very important absolutely flu season is what season is flu season so we do have um, usually it's in the fall is our uh, greater flu season and I'm not an expert here but there's sometimes always um, a little bit of, of a flu season in in the winter as well, running into, let's say, February, March sometimes. Um, and so, yes, thank you for bringing that up, that the COVID vaccine and the influenza vaccine are very important, along with the children making sure that they're up to date with their vaccines. Awesome. So the next piece I have, um, we touched on it a little bit, but I want to give us a chance to... Um, open it up a little bit further, um, is talking about our mental health as well. So um, another really important part of caring for our health is our mental health. And so what kind of resources are there or what kinds of things should we be thinking about in terms of newcomers getting settled and, and being aware of our mental health? I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, so I know that being in a new country can be very exciting. Everything is new. It's like you're going through the romantic phase of being in a new country. But then it can also get really stressful really quick, especially when you have the pressure of finding a new job and settling in, finding a house. Um, so I think I just want to, I guess, uh, set a reminder um, to those who are feeling that pressure and feeling stressed is to take it easy. Um, and, you know, like there is a lot of pressure, but... Um, find help as well and it's okay to you know reach out for help um, reaching out to community services like the YMCA you have these resources that are available to you and it's free um, and I can also help you connect with services and resources that are that are free for newcomers for uh, any immigration status it doesn't matter um, so yeah come uh, talk to me and uh, I can help you getting connected with with those resources Yeah, we've got a question over here. We'll grab the mic. Oh, well, there's, I have a question and it also I want to share because I know most of moms will maybe go through the same situation. So when I moved, first moved here, I had a um, seven year old kid who was just starting uh, first grade. And he was like really, didn't want to go to school because he was just in the, like from Spanish to English. And then um, in, the, in the elementary school, they put him into first, sorry, he was going to second, and they put him into first, second grade. So that, I guess, also made him feel uh, that he was with the small kids. So it didn't help, help at all. So, um, I reached, I was like looking for resources, but I reached the school, the principal, and I told her I need some help, like a psychologist or someone that could help him just go through it, right? Because for kids it's different. So she did help me because I needed someone even that speaks Spanish for him. And um, I, we did find somebody uh, that she will speak Portuguese, but kind of help the situation. And it was as simple as they just, they just moved him to second third grade and that helped his out of STEM a lot and improve everything like it was a blessing <laughs> so just like don't feel shy and just ask the principal I'm sure they also have the tools and right so just wanted to share that and with the same situation I would like to know if there's like available resources but for you for youth teenagers that you could share Yes, uh, there's this, um, it's a helpline that's free. It's called Kids Help Phone. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Um, that's available th all throughout Canada and it's available to everyone and it's free. 
Uh, they also have a website. They're available through text and chat on the website as well. And they have a lot of reading resources. Um, I think they also right now have uh, multiple languages. I believe Spanish would be one of them. Uh, so feel free to check out their website. Yes, it is. Just want to, um, this is just for the information. In Canada, you'll see a lot of the split classes. Uh, what she was talking about is a split class where uh, kids of two different grades are put together. It doesn't mean that, let's say a kid was in two, three split, like grade two and grade three kids sit together. It doesn't mean that grade two kids are doing much better. That's why they're put with three uh, grade three kids or the grade three is not doing well. That's why they're, they're combined with their grade two. It's not like that. The grade, the split class is based on the number of kids. Let's say there are 30 kids. And uh, per class, there's only 12 kids. So 12 plus 12, two classes. And the remaining six kids, they'll be put in a split class. It's not based on their ability. It's not, it's not a discrimination. It's not based on anything. It's just based on the number. Like they want to provide equal opportunity, opportunity to every single one. So they put the kids in a split class because of the number of kids, the, uh, the, uh, the more number of kids they have, they try to accommodate everybody in the same grade, but there are times when they can't. So that's when, they split camp, um, that's when the split uh, class comes. But there are advantages and disadvantages. I totally agree. My daughter has been in split class multiple times with the lower grade kids. I totally agree with you how you feel. Um, but remember, when our kids are like when a child is put with the lower grade, lower grade kids, the higher grade kids develop leadership qualities. So look into the positives that they get from that group. So it is not based on any discrimination. I just want you to know that the split classes do exist in Canada. And that's a good point because it has to, it is based on numbers because a teacher can only have a certain amount of it, it's a government um, initiative that they try to limit the amount of students in a class to support the teacher, right? So we want to make sure that in Ontario, all the children have the same opportunity to learn, and so they want to cap the numbers to a certain amount. And if in a grade at that school there's 30 kids, well, it's impossible for one teacher to have a class of 30 kids, so they put 22, I think, in that class, and they'll take the other eight and put them in a split number class. Good point. That's really great. Oh, I was ahead. just going to thank you for sharing that information about the class, because that is helpful, and I'm happy that you... Um, I'm happy that you seek or comfortable enough to ask your principal from your school, right? And I, I do want to encourage everyone here to feel like that. It's important that we all um, can reach out to someone. And at the health unit, I'm, I'm, I speak on a daily basis to individuals who are new to our area. And I want you to feel comfortable that you can call on us um, as health professionals to support you in this in in this new arri arrival to our city. Thank you. Yeah, that's part of the reason we want to put on events like this and just build those connections because it's really valuable for us to be all in a space together and, and hearing um, each other's stories and, and experiences and just being able to uh, learn from each other. So, again, thank you for sharing your uh, experiences. Um, I want to actually give Deepa a chance. I want to hear a little bit about physiotherapy and, um, you know, do you see a lot of newcomers in your work at the hospital or, you know, any trends in things that maybe we should know uh, about? In terms of trends, I work in ICU, okay? <laughs> so I, I can talk about the trends, but in terms of physical health, I want uh, you to know that it is very, very important that you keep up with your physical health because... Coming to a new country, we all are focused on how you're going to get settled here, uh, how I'm going to get a job, how am I going to excel in studies. That's, that's what comes to our brain. But we miss one point is like we are away from our family. We are away from our culture. We are away from our community. We are away from everything. So it is very easy to end up in a stressful situation. Back home, 
I, we had maids, we had uh, drivers, I didn't have to drive my car, and I didn't have to cook for myself. Like, I had people doing everything for myself. But after coming here, I had to do everything for myself, for my family, and my job, and everything. So it's very easy to end up in a stressful situation. So it is very important to pay specific attention to your physical health. My, I, I want to uh, share a personal story. We had a similar situation where it was uh, pretty stressful when we moved here, like a financial burden and um, um, cultural uh, shock and everything. And ultimately, my husband ended up with diabetes. And we didn't know how to get help. The first um, resource we accessed is health unit. And uh, we uh, went to a walk-in clinic because we, he needs medication and we didn't have any family physician. So we went to a walk-in clinic and he got um, medication from there. And then eventually he registered through the um, healthcare connections and um, he uh, subsequently we were able to find a physician, um, family physician for us. But if he would have paid attention to his physical health with the regular activities, like um, uh, uh, in, in terms of exercises or like not, not even exercises, like going for a walk, go for a hike, go for a swim, go out, get out of the house. That's very, very important, especially in winter. It's very easy to get depressed. We call it as feeling blue. That's, it's, it, it happens a lot for an immigrant because you don't have anybody to talk to. You don't have, any, you don't have a purpose to get out of the house. So get yourself, dress up and get out of the house. Go for, just, just go for a walk. Instead of taking a bus, just go for a short walk around the block, like walk to the store. It'll give you a purpose and it'll give you some exercises to get, off the, to, get off the, to get out of the house and to help yourself to get some exercises. Plus, stay hydrated. And uh, pay attention to your health. If you have a symptom, if you feel different, seek help. Seek help, that's very important because that's what we missed. He had lots of signs, we, didn't, we missed everything and uh, fortunately he didn't end up uh, with any complications. He's good now, but uh, we missed the signs. So I strongly recommend you all to pay attention to your health, keep yourself uh, healthy. And another thing I wanna say is the fruit juices here. It says 100%, right? It says 100% um, concentrate. So, it's the fruit juices, you know, the, the fruit juices we have, it says 100% concentrate. So when I came here, I didn't know what that 100% concentrate, it's full of sugar. It's full of sugar. <laughs> I don't know, I thought I'm, when I drink a cup of uh, juice, apple juice, I thought oh, I'm drinking, I'm, I'm, eating, uh, I'm, I'm eating an apple. That's not true. Juices are full of sugar. So it is important to pay attention to what you're eating. Eat healthy food have regular exercise, have a routine for yourself, and pay attention to your health and drink lots of water. This way you can keep healthy. Yeah, we've got a question over here, or a comment, either one. <laughs> um, more than a question is a comment that I just realized about. In the YMCA, um, let's say last year, they were running a program where parents can just drop the child and do some exercise or activity. But this year, they just shut up the program for all kids or kids who are more than six years old. And sometimes it's no, I mean, they are six, seven, but they are not 10 or 11 they, that can be alone. Uh, I know that probably it's about the financial situations any reasons, but they have the facilities to get up uh, some room and maybe look for volunteers. I know the city is in need of a lot of volunteers and many people is waiting to do some volunteers. So maybe we can find some people who are willing to be there, look for the children, will parents do some activity? Because sometimes even we know that from our countries, it's complicated, honestly. I'm here because you said that I can bring my child. If no, I, can, I couldn't do that. And sometimes it's beautiful to be mom and everything, but also that is a limitation. And I love my daughter a lot. <laughs> it's just a comment, but if, just to consider. 
and, and also I'm going for the next. When we come here to go for the college or something, we find this difficult that is not only for newcomers, it's in general. They care spots. It's impossible to get it. It's a long way list, and it's no getting better. Every year I see, because I was working in that field, and it's still looking the same. It never go out, down. Or, yeah. I don't know, I know. And probably it's going to be worse as soon as it will be like a $10 per day. Anyway, just use a comment and idea that we need to work forward to fix that. Uh, sorry, in terms, of, in terms of daycare, in addition to the licensed daycares, there are also home daycares available. Uh, I don't know the cost difference between the licensed and the home daycares, but I, I didn't know that when I came here. I didn't know about the home daycares. I only know now, so I'm just putting out the information there, that there are home daycares available. And also, um, if you are able to connect with your community, that will give a good resource as well. There might be parents or somebody uh, um, who, who could watch their kids as well with the, for a lesser amount of price. You know, uh, you know what I mean? Like you connect with your community. That's the key there. I attended last Tuesday, I attended the Immigration Summit. We had different um, partners at the table. And one of the um, group sessions that we had, we tried to identify what were some of the issues that some of our new families uh, were experiencing. And so I'm happy that you mentioned these two issues that I'm going to bring back to the table um, um, not necessarily, we're not having another meeting, but I do know the individual who um, was responsible for the for organizing the summit. So I'm going to bring these two important um, facts that you just brought up. So thank you for sharing. Yes, thank you. And I think we've got another question or comment here as well. Um, during your story, you mentioned about uh, the physician, the family doctor, and I would just would like to know how does that work to get one, if you could explain that. I would definitely like to take a moment to talk about this because this is um, a huge, I feel this is a huge issue in our city right now and I'd like to maybe share a bit of information. So. I, again, through our health information line, which is a health information line that um, everyone in the community has access to, um, throughout the day we are open Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. I um, talk to probably probably 3%, <laughs> well, let's, let's put it this way. I talk to many people every day about their concern with the fact that they don't have a primary health care provider. And it's new families as well as um, other members from the community. And the issue, what's happening right now is we've had several practices. And I, when I say a practice, I mean a physician that has approximately 5,000 clients, patients. And so we've had four practices of physicians that have been practicing for a, for a number of years. Their practices have closed, so that means that they're on top of newcomers coming to the area looking for uh, physicians. We have these individuals in the community who have lost their physicians either because the practice has closed or the doctor has retired. So it's causing a huge issue. And so there's a few things right now that is happening uh, around the city. We are trying our best to help out individuals who don't have a family doctor. When someone calls into the health information line, I really try to get to know what their situation is, find out if they have children, find out if they're pregnant, um, and, and f really try to help them. We're all, the thing is, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same situation. And if we're living in Sudbury, this is what we're all living, right? And so we have to come up with ways around it. So number one is Healthcare Connect. Healthcare Connect is a provincial initiative where the government has 
created a opportunity for us to call and put our names on a list if you don't have a family doctor. So that's number one, and I have a few pamphlets here. So if anyone wants to call and register, they can call or they can uh, sign up online. The thing is, though, you do need uh, a health card number to be able to sign up. That's number one. Now, if you don't have a health card number, you can call the health unit. And we do have a growing family health clinic at the health unit that we can refer you to if you don't have a health card. But the issue is, remember what I just said about how we're all in the same boat, what, what's happening with this growing family health clinic is they've received a lot of referrals from not just us at the health unit, but from other community agencies who are trying to refer their families to the growing family health clinic, and there's a long waiting list right now. So that's what's happening there. So we have the, the Healthcare Connect, we have the Growing Family Health Clinic. We have walk-in clinics, in the meantime, that can support individuals who are looking, but until they find someone, which sometimes I've heard that the, the wait time for Healthcare Connect to find you a doctor can be around a year. And so that's a long time to be waiting without to be waiting for health care. You shouldn't be waiting for any health care if you have any issues. So in the meantime, we have walk-in clinics. And so it's to become familiar with walk-in clinics, what they are. They're, they're doctors who either have their own practice, but they will work extra at a walk-in clinic where you can just walk in, wait for an appointment, you wait your turn to be seen by a physician. And so those run during the week, on weekends, during the evening. Um, so you go online and you say find, you, you try to find a uh, walk-in clinic in your area. And what I tell individuals who call in to the health unit, if they don't have a family doctor, what they need to do is find a clinic near their home. If you can find a clinic near your home, and if you can attend that clinic all the time, then they become familiar with you. You become familiar with the physicians who work that clinic. And, and you can also advocate for yourself and share with the physicians, with the physician working, that you are a newcomer, you're new to the area, and you don't have a family doctor. So that way, you're sharing your story, you're advocating for yourself, and perhaps that one time the physician can say, I have an opening and maybe perhaps I can, I can take you or your family. Or they could say, I have a colleague who's taking on a patient. It's all word of mouth. It's who you talk to. It's how you, you connect with people. And that's what I want to share with everyone today is, is make those connections. If you need medical care, don't be afraid to access the walk-in clinics. They have... Um, very capable and great physicians who, who do the care of a family physician without um, having the, the they, they work in walk-in clinics at different hours and so they're available to help and support um, families. Now, I don't know if that's a segue where you want me to talk about my program. Sure. Okay, so sure, go uh, ahead. <laughs> so, at our health unit, we do have a program called Healthy Babies, Healthy Children. And I know that um, families who have children zero to six um, oftentimes will be seeking support. And so if you call the health unit and you say you have young children and you're looking, you're a newcomer to the area and you want some help, you can register for our program. It's free um, as long as you have children zero to six. And so what, what are the types of things that we can help you with? Well, we can help you strategize about how to find a family doctor. We can help you strategize um, about your health. We can ensure that your children's vaccines are up to date. We can ensure, and when we talk about physical activity, we ensure that your children are, are um, their physical activity or their, their health, their mental health. We can ensure that that's... Um, well taken care of. We can also make sure that your children are meeting their milestones. And if they aren't, then we can support you with activities to uh, support you there. We can also help you with parenting. Sometimes coming to a new country or, or even just 
parenting in general is not easy sometimes and our children go through things that sometimes we want to support them. So our program, um, you, you uh, would register for our program, you're assigned a nurse and a parent support worker, a family home visitor. And so what they do is they connect with you first over the phone and then they schedule home visits where they come and see you in your home and they can also support you virtually where you would do a, um, a virtual visit. And so again, that's all about supporting you and meeting your needs where you're at. So that program is called Healthy Babies, Healthy Children. You would access it by calling the health unit. Um, and so th um, that's available. The other thing that I want to tell uh, individuals, if there's anyone here who is pregnant, um, we do have uh, a nurse that goes up to the hospital every day to meet the moms who've uh, the family meet the f moms and the families who've had their babies, and we let them know that the health unit does call all families within 48 hours of their discharge, and that phone call is just to see how uh, families are doing at home once the baby is home, and then we support you over the phone during that phone call by doing a telephone assessment, but we also support you by helping you to feed your child. So if you're have questions about breastfeeding or, or um, supplementary feedings, then we uh, can either get you into our breastfeeding clinic, which we have two breastfeeding clinics in Sudbury, one at Paris Street and also one in Valcairn. And so we can support you with, with the challenges if there are any. And again, our health information line, which I've talked about already, is also available where we can just, um, you know, one day, especially today, I spoke to several families whose children were sick. There's a lot of gastroenteritis going around. There's a lot of colds going around. March break, I guess families were uh, doing a lot of group activities, perhaps, and, and um, so... Uh, you can call if you have a question about a symptom for your child and we will support you over the phone and hopefully um, take care of all your questions. We've got a question or a comment? Both, that works too. Thank you very much. Um, I have this question. You just uh, about finding a family doctor. Um, I will. I would like to know. Um, can I just go to the hospital instead of a walk-in clinic? So the eMERGE department at the hospital, so the ER, uh, the emergency room, oftentimes has long wait times. So when you're going to the emergency at the hospital, you could be waiting eight. 10, 12 hours sometimes to access care. And so sometimes walk-in clinics, they're easier to access physicians. So you can have maybe a half hour wait, an hour wait. It's not as long as the emergency room. Now, there's a number that you can call during the week, our health information line. You can call Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, but at night and on weekends, you can always call Telehealth Ontario. And Telehealth Ontario is a phone line, just like our health information line at the health unit. It's a phone line where you can speak to a nurse. And the nurse will do an assessment over the phone and she'll let you know where you need to go if you, want, if you need to go access a doctor within 24 hours or if you, if you could access a walk-in clinic for your issue. Or she'll let you know if you need to um, go access emergency room services at the hospital. So when I'm sick, I need to talk to tell health Ontario, Telehealth Ontario to find out where should I go. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to make, com make, make um, a comment on Healthcare Connect. Uh, I've been on the list for like at least eight months already. I heard nothing back. Yeah. I'm not hopeful uh, they're going to back, get back to me anytime soon. So I would like to know how um, I can go about this thing. Um, Walking walk -in clinics, I'm not sure about the qualifications. Um, I don't know, because based on my personal experience, mm -hmm. I went there once, and then they uh, gave me some pres prescription. I tried, I worked, and then after three days or something, um, it went very worse, way worse than before. Uh, and then I went to this campus doctor, and the doctor looked at my history, like a uh, medical history, and, and asked me, how could you take this medicine? Do you know how dangerous it is for you to take this medicine? 
I said, no, I don't, <laughs> you know? So it's very confusing and I also experience discrimination when I go to walk-in clinics. They ask me whether I have a health uh, card or something. So for me, I'm very confused about this family doctor thing. I would like to have one because if we have a good relationship, it would be easier for me uh, to, yeah. And it's like clinics, I don't know about the qualification. I don't know who, who is better. And, and for this connect thing, um, it's not that hopeful. So I would like to know, like, you know, really, like, that's why I ask you about, can I just go to the hospital when I'm sick instead of going through all these things? So you're bringing forth some very important um, point, uh, discussion points. Um, I have connected recently with the individual responsible for the um, Healthcare Connect list, and she was informing me that right now the, she's been helping people who find a doctor who've been on the list for 12 to 14 months. That's the average right now. Oh, so I'm looking at two years probably. <laughs> so 12, 12 months is a year? Yeah. Yeah, so 12 to but 14 it's average. months. What if it's not average then? Yeah. <laughs> right? So unfortunately what's happening is how this works is you're put on a list and in, as family doctors in the area open up, they, they come to the list. So they let Healthcare Connect know that they have space to take on new patients. But right now, as I'm sharing with you, this, I'm going to share with you what's happening in Sudbury, okay? We have doctors who have closed their practices because they've retired. So there are three physicians who have retired. And I'm gonna also share that there's a physician who's recently passed who had a large practice and that's put on a, it, it's put a huge number of individuals without a family doctor. So what has happened is the physicians who are retiring, they're actually getting other family doctors in the area to take on 250 clients. Can you take on 250 of, of my most needed patients? Can you take on 250? Can you take on 250? So the physicians in the community have taken on patients from these practices so that nobody's left without a doctor. But in the meantime, that has put stress on their practice. And so they aren't able to take on more at this time. So they aren't able to go on the list and take more because they've had to take on physicians, um, physicians individuals. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, it seems like those who have a family doctor already have the priority to be assigned to different practices. But for newcomers who don't have a family doctor, they are going to be put on the waiting list. To so, just, um, so I'm going to just... Um, share with you that it's, it's individuals, the physicians have asked individuals, individual doctors, to take on the most, the ones who have the highest priority. So, so if they have um, elderly patients who really need to be seen, those are the ones that have gone off to physicians because they there's a, a huge need. The others have just been like... Um, yeah, and so I understand there's a, ser I, I, when I shared with you that I answer a lot of phone calls from individuals who don't have family doctors, I, it, I'm sitting here to, tonight because I have been going to my manager to say this is a huge issue, and I'm here tonight to share that in, in Sudbury we're all, we're in a, we're in a pickle. I don't know how else to say it. And I understand your frustration. Yes. And so if you and I want to connect at the end, we can talk a bit more yes, about please. how I can help you. Oh, thank you. We have a nurse practitioners in Sudbury as well. So they are a great resource too. They provide medications as well. So if you can't find a GP, uh, if you can't find a, a family physician, don't be afraid to connect with the nurse practitioner. They are amazing resource in Sudbury. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna share with you that there are nurse practitioner clinics in Sudbury, but also we used to hand out the number to the nurse practitioner clinics to say um, the nurse practitioners are taking on patients, but they've asked us 
over six months ago to not hand out their number anymore because they're overwhelmed as well and they don't have room <laughs> to take on new patients. So I, I, I appreciate you sharing that, but I think we're, we're um, no, it's just that not many people know this because we, not many people deal with this every day, but I deal with this every day and I'm here to share with you that it's a struggle we're all going through and I do want to support you if, if you want to come to me afterwards, we can talk about it, okay? Hi, and um, for example, I need a specialist in veins because I have like a, a, a problem with the circulation and I went to the walk-in clinic and they told me, oh no, you don't, it's like a, 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 um, uh, 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 like a plastic surgery, like a cosmetic thing. And it's not a cosmetic thing. It's inside my, my body that hurts the veins. It's not like the, 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 outside. the outside, but inside. And they told me that it's like a cosmetic thing and I need like a specialist. It's not like a cosmetic thing. So could we maybe connect after the, the session and I can just provide you with some information? Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm so glad. Thanks. It's just really quick. Um, I've been to the emergency room. I have three boys, so <laughs> I use it sometimes. And I'd like to know, because I've seen that the time, I know it takes a long time and I'm willing to wait, but I also see that some people, I don't know what, I would like to know what's the logic into like who gets first the attention. Because for me, it was my kid that maybe opened his head. so. I don't see any sign that will say, okay, um, pregnant woman, like, could you tell me what are the, the priorities? Yes, so in our eMERGE department, in our emergency room, we have two systems. We have a system where if it's urgent, meaning if it's life-threatening, like breathing, like stroke, heart attack, so that is a systemic um, evaluation that they go, like they get precedence, right? So they go in right away. They try to limit wait times in our emergency systems, in our emergency rooms. They try to limit wait times. So then they send, they fast track issues like um, stitches or fractures. So they try to they try to streamline the services and send them there so that it limits the wait times. And so that's how they triage. So there is a nurse when you first come, when you present yourself in the eMERGE department, you have to get triaged. So you get a nurse who asks you what's going on and then she sends you where you need to go. What happens though is if you go in a section if it's fast track and you go into a section where there's a lot of people waiting, you could sometimes be waiting a long time in that blue zone, let's say. If you go in the yellow zone where it's not red zone like cardiac or if you're in another zone and there's, there aren't many people, then you're going in before these people. So that's what happens in our eMERGE department, in our emergency rooms. It's sometimes you see people come in ahead of you and you, or, or after you and they're being seen before. It's because you're in different zones. And so that's how our eMERGE department works. I know that might not help um, to solve the issue that you were waiting long, but that's why if, if you find out through healthcare, can, uh, through uh, telehealth, if you do need to go to eMERGE, because those things could sometimes be seen at a walk-in clinic. So doctors can do stitches at a walk-in clinic, or they can send you for an x-ray and you don't have to be waiting in the eMERGE department, and that's why we can sometimes help you to, to try to save you time in the eMERGE department. So, sorry, I just wanted to share, uh, because you mentioned about the nurse practitioner, so actually I do have one, and I would say, I don't know even then if we can still do that or not, I found it a great solution, but anything that is not, I would say, time, you don't have to seek it in timely manner. As an example, for me, my nurse practitioner, when I ask, 
it takes sometimes a month to a month and a half just to be able to connect with her. So when I'm sick, I'm actually stuck still to go to the walk-in clinics and or just to medicate yourself, which I find is quite an issue here in Canada. A lot of people actually are taught to medicate themselves and it's quite harmful in the way it does and they do because I had the same issue in a walk-in clinic. Sometimes I wonder what do they do and if they are actually qualified because when I go in, they ask me what do you need and what do you want? They don't assess me. They just basically ask me to tell them what I need. <laughs> but when you go see a doctor, you kind of hope they know the answer and not yourself. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of annoying I find how it works. And so my question is that unfortunately we can't all afford it. But for the person who can afford it, is there another alternative? So even if I need to pay, where can I go? Because is there like other clinics that maybe we need to pay for it, but at least you know you can be well taken care for and care of. Sometimes that's the alternatives I want to go for and be like, I'll pay for it. I just want to see someone who can tell me if I'm good and whatever they can give me access to other specialists too. Because as the issue is I'm specialists, you don't even know how to get access to them. And back home in my other country, that's true that there it was easy to get a specialist. I had my own gynecologist, I had my own, and you can see them. And here, just to see one specialist is that, well, you need to go there. They eventually give you another referral, but actually you needed to see another one. And just like basically chasing like actually a mouse somewhere just to be able to access to someone to tell you what's going on. I, I understand. I hear you. I understand your frustration. And the, the OHIP system in Sudbury, in, in Canada, is... Um, challenging for that sense because we all we have a health card and our services are covered which sometimes makes wait times really long to access services your question about can I go somewhere to pay for this brings up very um, it brings up I don't know what the word is but it brings up very um, it brings up a topic that is talked about but controversial, let's say, because what happens if we start that, if we start privatizing healthcare in Canada, if we make it so that if you are avail if you are if you have the means to access service then what's going to happen to the individuals who don't have the means, right? We're, 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 we're opening up a can of worms where it's going to be everyone who can afford access to health care will be able to, and then what's going to happen to the others. So in Canada, we haven't opened up the topic of privatizing health care, even with long wait times, for that reason that the health coverage right now is the same for everyone. It doesn't matter if you make over $100,000 a year or if you make less than $20,000 a year, the health coverage is the same. And so that's just how things are right now. And, and it's unfortunate because you are waiting a long time sometimes for a, f a specialist or a physician. So if I were to be able to pay because I can afford it, just to have see a doctor once per year, to just check everything, then it will allow to leverage actually for the other doctors to see people who actually need it better. Sometimes just to be able to connect to someone and check, okay, mm -hmm. you're relatively in good health, you're good to go for another year, but even that is not yet. Mm -hmm. So if you could have just, I know that once I, I actually met a client who say he's living in Kirk County, he go in Toronto to go see a clinic once a year, but the issue is that I don't know how to access those clinics. I don't know who they are, so if you have a name of the clinic that we can access, and yeah, that's not the more convenient. <laughs> but at this point, that's just like if we could private a little bit, but not being able to uh, to go to a point where that means that the person who can't afford it then I have a worse uh, health provider. Like if you can have a little bit that if you can afford it, you can still be able to go see someone that will uh, be able to leverage actually like the other system to have more capabilities for the people who actually truly need it. And if you can afford it and it doesn't like 
I, I just don't understand why you could not have it, the, the two of them working together as long as you properly, like, you know, you still put barriers that you can't have, like, all the good doctors that go on the other one that is privatized, because that's also an issue. And we are like, okay, you have only the good ones with the good money, so they would all go to private. But if you're able to make it, like, in a right way, that could be able to leverage them for people who actually do need it more. Unfortunately, what happens is um, this is a bigger discussion, like, at the federal level, and um, I hear you, but I don't think that I, even working at the health unit, I would have any impact or I could bring that forth. That's a totally true comment. This is hard. We didn't expect all of our conversations around healthcare to be easy, and that's okay. That sometimes we need to have hard conversations. So, it's good. Hi. Oh, um, I just want to check with you. I understand that there is a difficulty now in getting a family doctor. So I just want to know, uh, I am an international student, but in the event that I am, while I'm studying, I got pregnant, um, what are the available help that I can tap into? Or should I be waiting for a family doctor to see me? Or where will I go? What should I do? I mean, so what's, what's, the, what's the first thing that I need to do if I got pregnant? So if you are an international student and you're studying at um, one of the colleges or university here in Sudbury, you would access your um, medical uh, service. So um, have you been told that you can access a nurse practitioner or some... So check with your institution, and we can talk about it afterwards, but... Are you at Laurentian, Cambrian, or Collège Boreal? You're at Cambrian? So they have medical services there where you can access. And if not, you would go to a walk-in clinic to seek a referral to an obstetrician. And so walk-in clinic doctors can make referrals to obstetricians. And um, the individual would then be seen around 12 weeks so the walk-in clinic doctor would care for the individual, and that's what I was talking about. If you go to the same walk-in clinic or you see the same physician, if you try to find out when that physician is going to work again, you can come back and see that physician again at a later time. So, so you, would, um, you would seek a referral to an obstetrician, and perhaps you would call the health unit to register for our Healthy Babies program where we can start supporting you prenatally and, and helping you uh, along and answering some of your questions. Okay. Awesome, yeah, I see a question over here in the corner as well. Is there anything helpful we can do to help um, show that there's a need in our community for doctors, like polls or surveys? to kind of help along the process of bringing more doctors to our area. So I'm going to share with you that this was a huge discussion at our, our, at our immigration summit last week. It was brought forth uh, by numerous players at the table, numerous uh, agencies. And um, the city is well aware that this is an issue. Um, and recently they have so the city has hired a few physicians to work for the Centre de Santé, which is the francophone um, community service. But they are now um, realizing that they need to um, provide uh, other supports, right, for our non-francophone community. And so up until last week, I didn't have any updates as to how that was going to work out, but they are definitely aware of the situation. Um, I shared my, <laughs> my concerns because I answer our phone line for the health unit, and so I shared some stories, I shared some difficulties um, that individuals are sharing with me, and um, I'm going to stay on top of it. I really am going to try to um, continue to work with our partners to try to see how we can support individuals in the community. All right, we're almost at the end of our session tonight, so I do still want to, if anybody has any more questions that you've come up with or comments you want to share, I'll definitely give you a chance to do that. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our panelists for joining us tonight because um, 
it's been really great to have their insight and their expertise with us tonight. Um, as they mentioned, they've got some resources up here if you would like it, and also, um, you know, as Claudette mentioned, if you do need, want to touch base afterwards, um, she's here. Um, and then uh, as well, you'll notice on your uh, table a few things. There's the surveys that if you could take a moment to fill in the survey for us, we would really appreciate that. It just helps us know what you appreciated about the program and what um, maybe we can do for you again in the future. And there's also, if you see specifically the pens that are white and red, um, there's the extension on there for the uh, uh, health unit phone line there as well if you want to be able to call and uh, ask your questions. So you can definitely take those uh, red and white pens with you um, for that information. Yeah, so we'll just, uh, does anybody have any last questions? We're good? All right, we'll be around as well if you do have some questions. So thank you so much for coming tonight and um, feel free to finish up any snacks that we have over there as well. <laughs>